important announcement from Johnette. Um, we have a new Christmas tree, and we need volunteers to help decorate the new Christmas tree Friday morning at 10 o'clock. So please see Johnette, or just show up and be ready to work. That would be great. Okay, so 10 o'clock this Friday, uh, decorating the Christmas tree. Are there any birthdays for today? John Sebastian, where are you? What is your birthday? Tomorrow. Okay, does anyone else have a birthday this week? And Larry Steiner's the same day? Okay. He's not here, but we're going to sing anyway. Is this too loud? Sorry. Stand back a little bit. Any other birthdays? Eric Harrison. Uh-huh. Virginia Carlisle's grandson. Uh-huh. Right. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and sing happy birthday to them, the ones that are here and the ones that are not. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Are there any other announcements that we need to be aware of today? Okay, well, we'd like to welcome everyone here, and we'll just have a little short prelude. Yeah.
Please join me in prayer. Eternal God, today we give thanks for so many things, for family, for friends, for life, and for health, for the smiles that we see on the faces of our children, and for the aroma of food that we will use in our celebration of thanks. We are grateful for a community filled with caring people. We are thankful for a place to worship. We are grateful for our facility and for our leadership. Blessings constantly surround us. Our great abundance continues to amaze and sometimes even confuse us. So often we forget to humble ourselves and realize how circumstantial our great fortune is. Forgive us when we take our blessings for granted, and fail to say thank you when we forget to show our appreciation. Also forgive us when we give in to the temptation to think that we have nothing for which to be thankful. And forgive us when we assume that somehow we deserve that which we have. Forgive us for our nearsightedness. We pray for the wisdom to see that the blessings that we have are ours to be used for the edification of your peaceful kingdom. We are indeed blessed. And yet, we see so much confusion and suffering in the world. We see the crying faces of mothers and fathers, of sons and daughters. We see families suffering with unbelievable grief and confusion. We see lives that are torn and crippled by violence, by disease, by war, by hatred. Our hearts cry out for them. 
Our minds remain confused and yet awed by eternity. And we turn again to you. And so God of peace and God of human potential, we beseech you, please bring peace to your world. Bring peace to those children who are lost in the mayhem of sickness, poverty, war, and violence. Deliver them from world issues that they did not create and that none of us really understand. And open our eyes, our minds, to see that which we can do to truly be instruments in your hands. Open us to opportunities to change the tears that we see into smiles the grief that we sense into joy, the disease that we see into health and strength, the violence into gentle kindness, and the world of pain into a world of peace. Yes, open our minds to find our place and to be the blessings to the world that you would have us be. Amen. I'd like to welcome everyone here to our service of praise and thanksgiving. We come expectant with thankful hearts, and we are aware of our blessings and the many people who are less fortunate and in need. There are many who will be sharing with us today testimonies and prayers to help us focus when we see Christ in the eyes of the needy around us. David Gross will be sharing our Um, sermon today entitled Five Kernels of Corn. I hope that we are open to his words and that we reflect on our own lives as to how we can respond to his talk. I wanted to call your attention to two new hymns that will be used in our service today. The first one will be sung as a solo by George Farnell. It's hymn 213. But in your um, program, you'll notice that it says, um, Congregation is invited to read and meditate as the hymn is sung. I'd like for you to look at the words because they're very meaningful. Also, there's a misprint, uh, the last hymn, 614. If you will remain seated there, the choir will be singing that hymn. And then following that hymn, um, Eric will ask you to stand and lead you in the sending out statement and then the blessing on the food. For the call to service today, I am reading from the book of Alma, chapter 1, verses 45 through 47. They did not send any away who were naked, or that were hungry, or that were thirsty, or that were sick, or that had not been nourished. And they did not set their hearts upon riches. Therefore, they were liberal to all, both old and young, both bond and free, both male and female, whether out of the church or in the church having no respect to persons as to those who stood in need.
bow with me, please. Our gracious Heavenly Father, at this time of year, we experience a heightened awareness of thanksgiving. We are grateful for our opportunity to share in the bounty this land gives us and the opportunity we have to share this bounty with those less fortunate than we are. We are grateful for the opportunity to share also our lives with one another, to share good times and not so good times, for the opportunity to offer our prayers of thanksgiving to you and our prayers in behalf of one another. As we continue in this season of thanksgiving, may our circle grow larger and larger to include more and more souls. May we bring joy to more people than we have, have in the past. Continue with us through this hour and forever. We ask these things, blessings in the name of our Lord, Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. <laughs> From Matthew twenty-five thirty-five. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I cannot give a testimony about this without talking about the food bank. I know we talk about this a lot, but it's such a blessing. If you have not come and shared in the food bank, you really need to because you will also be blessed. People come here on one Saturday a month and we are so blessed to be able to give them food. I'm sure it's a very humbling experience for them to come and ask for help. We give them food to feed their bodies, but they're just not hungry for food. And we don't just give them food. They crave love, support, companionship, and we give them that. It's easy to stand behind a table and hand out food, right, that you don't even have to pay for. There was this last food bank I was here and there was a lady. Somehow I'm always at the last table of this desserts. <laughs> and um, she came by and she said, I've already gotten my food. Can I go switch this out and get some chocolate? And I said, just take it. And uh, she broke down and she said that her car was broken down and she was very upset that everything had just gone the wrong way for her. And of course I hugged her and told her that it would get better, that I promised it would get better. I knew it would. And she appreciated it so much. We embraced for a long time. And I gave her the words of encouragement that I could. And we all do that. I, see, I think that they see how we react with each other and they see us doing that. Am I bragging about us? Yes, heck yes I am. We are awesome. When we leave here after those days, we really feel like we have given more than we needed to. We listen to them, we carry their food, we give them rides home, we laugh and we hug and we give them hope. So I encourage all of you to come share in the food bank and share the blessings that I have had. Will you pray with me? <laughs> Dear Lord, please help us to all keep our eyes open and to be receptive to those around us, Lord, that need our help and encouragement in more ways than just giving them food, Lord. Help us to feed their, them spiritually, spiritually, Lord. Please help us to always have this in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
As most of you know, our church has Solid Rock, and Solid Rock is our youth group. And for a lot of the youth that come to Solid Rock, it is their only church. It is their only exposure to Christ. When we first started off with Solid Rock, we had a whopping three to four people. Now we have, at our last Solid Rock, about 16 youth, and we are still growing. For Solid Rock, for me, is a way to come and express what I feel about religion. I feel free and welcome to express what I need to say and to just let everything out. And I know a lot of the youth that come feel the same way. They feel welcomed here in this church to say whatever they need to say about Christ or about problems they may have. And I have been pulled towards the church initiative to invite people to Christ by inviting those youth to Solid Rock every second Saturday of each month. And I also invite all of you. It's not just for youth. It's, it is geared towards youth, but I invite each and every one of you to come and experience what, what we all talk about. It's a great experience, and it's, it's changed my life a lot. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, please bless everyone here in church today. May you help guide them to pull others towards Christ and towards yourself. Uh, make them feel called towards you and to feel welcomed in your presence. Amen. My talk is about uh, when I was a senior in high school, uh, there were two old men that lived in a plantation above our home. One of them was a pharmacist. The other one was an alcoholic. Had a foul mouth, smoked bull durham tobacco. He got to where he could not go into town to get his groceries, and my Uncle Joe Arguellas lived on the corner of Golfville Road and Seaman Road, which led up into the uh, plantation. And I was driving a school bus at the time, and my route went by this old man's house. Well, my uncle got a tumor in his brain and died. And one day, as I, at the day of the funeral, I was coming with my bus, and he stepped out in the middle of the road and stopped me and said, uh, I want to go to Joe's funeral. I said, okay. Well, I drove the bus home and uh, told my folks, I said, uh, Coot was his name, Coot Money, wants to go to the funeral. And uh, I went and picked him up, and uh, he had a bad odor. And uh, my mother said, now, you, you're you not going to take him in the house. You're not bringing him in the house. And I said, okay. And there was a wash shed outside where the washing machine was. So I took the old man in there, and I bathed him and shaved him. I can't remember where I got the suit and the shoes and the socks for him, but I did. I got everything for him. And I brought him to the funeral. Uh what happened after that, I cannot tell you that by this time I left home, but uh, somebody else picked up where my uncle left off. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we come now realizing that there are many things in our lives that keep you from us, and I just pray for a healing that uh, we can turn our lives over to you by repenting, and I do pray for our country, our church, our church families, and all those that are ill and sick, and the shut-ins. And I do ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'd like to take just a moment of um, silent prayer to reflect on times when maybe we, we do not see those in need around us.
It's this coming Thursday, and you waited all along for the big event. As always, dinner is a fashionably late afternoon gathering. You skip breakfast for this, and us men folks have even loosened our belt in preparation as we sat down. Then a large covered food tray is placed in the center of the table. Everyone's mouth is watering, and the lid is lifting, unveiling five kernels of corn. That's all for this year. Well, the Pilgrim Fathers that landed in Plymouth Rock nearly 400 years ago knew nothing of the affluent times that you and I enjoy in this great country of ours. The next time you and I are tempted to complain about our temporal status, remember the following. During the first long winter at Plymouth Rock, seven times as many graves were dug as homes for the living. The ship, which was to bring provisions for the new settlement, only brought 35 more mouths to feed and not an ounce of provisions. Touching indeed is the picture of William Brewster rising from a scantily Plymouth dinner consisting of a plate of clams and a cup of cold water to thank God for the abundance of the sea and the treasures in the sand. The, Plymouth, the pilgrims didn't have much, but they possessed a great gratitude, which is what America is built upon. These stalwart people were strong and devout and sincere and were timbers upon which this nation was founded. For many of those first thanksgivings, the pilgrims had a custom of putting five kernels of corn on a plate for dinner. Each member of the family would pick up a kernel and tell what they were thankful for. It was to remind them that the very first pilgrims were in such dire shape that they only had five kernels of corn per person per day. Well, this morning, let's take those five kernels of corn and using Psalms 103, verses 1 through 5, as our backdrop, think about things to thank God for. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Psalm 103 stands out as a great psalm because it's a pure praise to God. There's no request, there's no petition, there's no prayer. David doesn't complain about his circumstances or his enemies. David apparently was awestruck by all of God's blessings when he wrote this psalm. Looking around his life, he counted his blessings, and instead of complaining about his burdens, it dawned on, Davis, it dawned on David just how much God had done for him. Our first kernel is the kernel of forgiveness, who forgives all your sins. I once saw a Christian card that said, if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent a teacher. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent an economist. But since our greatest need was for forgiveness, God sent us a savior. In the Last Supper, the Lord said, this is my blood, which was shed for the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness absolves us from the punishment of sin, which we deserve. Each of our sins can be covered by the death of Christ. In John, he says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us. And also God says, forgive our iniquities and remember our sin no more. In Christ, we can be delivered from the guilt of, past, the, guilt of the past. Claire Barton, the founder of the American Red Cross, was once reminded of a day when a vicious deed was done by someone to her some years ago. But she acted as if she had never heard of the incident. And finally, a friend said, don't you remember that incident? And Claire's response was, no, I distinctly remember forgetting it. From Hebrews, we read, for I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. There's no mistaking about it. 
God offers forgiveness. Any person, all any person needs to do is repent and forsake his sins, and God will forgive them and revoke the penalty of sin. King David is clear in his psalm, God forgives. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. The forgiveness that our God offers is a promise of the Father, a provision of the Son, a product of the Holy Spirit, a proclamation of the Bible, and required practice in our church. From the depths of our heart, a sense of gratitude for God's forgiving grace should well up in us. Though, of course, we don't deserve it, but he gives it to us anyway. Our first kernel of thanksgiving is the thanksgiving of forgiveness. Our second is the thanksgiving of redemption. With forgiveness comes redemption. The word redemption is taken from the context of human beings that are offered for sale to the highest bidder. Condemned to a miserable existence, these slaves are powerless to escape. Their only hope was redemption, an uncommon process whereby they purchased in order to be set free. Scripture uses the tragedy of slavery to illustrate our human predicament. Without God's intervention, we're all hopelessly lost in self and sin. Our only hope is in Christ who can redeem us, setting, uh, setting us free from our sins and the penalty over, penalty over our lives. Describing what God has said to us, Paul said, in Christ we have redemption through his blood. The story of the prodigal son was one of my dad's favorite sermon subjects. And it's a story in Luke 15 about a, a gentleman who lived, a, lived in a slimy pit. The prodigal son, of course, wasted all his money and, and wasted in, in wild living. He ended up, of course, in a hog pen. And so to speak, he was eating with the hogs. And I'm sure he said something like, this is the pits, or this is slop. When he finally reached his senses, he decided to go back to his home and live like one of his father's servants. He figured that was better than the life he had. He was humbled, and even more humbled himself further by admitting his sin. He was going home. And of course, he had a father at home who loved him dearly and was anxiously awaiting for his return. Many people experience living in pits, the slimy pits, and God does redeem us from pits. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our Lord. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. If you want to understand your personal worth to God, all you have to do is look at the price that God paid for you. Or do you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom God, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you are you were bought at a price, so glorify your God in your body. The price of redemption is the the price of our redemption was the death of God's only begotten son. Pat Neff was governor of Texas from 1921 to 1925. He was also a lifelong Christian. He had a habit of traveling throughout the state and visiting the various penitentiaries where he would talk to the convicts. On each occasion after he finished speaking with them, he would invite anyone that wanted to stay and speak directly to him. On every, occur, uh, every occasion, numbers of men would remain to tell their story. And one by one, the governor would listen to stories about a frame-up, about an injustice, or a judicial blunder. Each, of course, asked to be freed. Finally, one man came up to the governor and said, I just want to say that I'm guilty. I did what you sent me here for. 
but I believe I paid for it. If I were freed, I would do everything in my power to be a good citizen and prove myself worthy of your mercy. The governor pardoned the man. Why? Because he admitted his guilt. So it is with us. We are to, if we are to be redeemed from this awful sentence we're under, there's a difference. We can't say that we've paid for any of our sins. As the whole hy old hymn says, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Let us be thankful that we have redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sins. A third kernel of healing, third kernel is the kernel of healing. From verse 3b, who heals all our diseases. With the forgiveness of sin, the Bible says he heals our diseases. While not every person is physically healed during their mortal lives, there is no disease physically or spiritually that God cannot heal. There are a variety of ways that God wants to bring healing to the lives of people and to his creations. From Chronicles, we read, If my people, who are called by his name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. As a people of God, when we together seek God with all our hearts, he can bring healing and forgiveness to our lives and to our land. Psalmist cried out, Lord of Lord my God, I called to you for help and you healed me. Also, God heals the brokenhearted and binds up his wounds. And from Isaiah, but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that he brought us peace was on him. By his wounds we are healed. In Mark, in the chapter 2, friends of the paralyzed man was lowered through the roof of the house that Jesus was in. Jesus first told the man his sins were forgiven, and then against the interest of the Pharisees, he told the man to take up his mat and walk. With forgiveness comes healing. A healed soul is a much greater eternal significance than a healed body. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call for the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make them well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous person is powerful and effective. When we receive forgiveness from God and from one another, healing comes to all those involved. We are, the, we are Christ's hands and Christ calls us to be his conduit for healing. Healing is our third kernel. With Thanksgiving Day near, the first grade teacher gave her class a fun assignment to draw a picture of something that they were all thankful for. Most of the class would be considered economically disadvantaged, but still many of the kids would have turkey and all the other goodies of Thanksgiving. These the teacher thought would be the subjects of their artwork, and they were. But Douglas made a different kind of picture. Douglas was a different kind of boy. He was the teacher's true child of misery, frail and unhappy. As the other child children played at recess, Douglas was likely to stand close to her side. One could only guess the pain that was behind Douglas's sad eyes. Yes, his picture was different. His picture was, was he would, when asked to draw a picture of something he was thankful for, he drew a hand, nothing else, just an empty hand. His abstract image captured the imagination of his peers. What could the hand be? Some suggested it was the turkey. It was the former who raises the turkeys. Another suggested a police officer because he cares and protects the people. Some others guessed it was God, for God, God's hand feeds us. And so the discussion went on to the young artist was forgotten. When the children had all gone to their assignments, 
She paused at Douglas's desk and bent down and asked him whose hand it was. The little boy looked away and murmured, It's yours, teacher. She recalled the times she had taken his hand and walked with him here and there as she had other students. How often she had said, Take my hand, Douglas. We'll go outside. Or let me show you how to hold your pencil. Or let's do this together. Douglas was most thankful for his teacher's hand. Brushing aside a tear, she went back to her work. Our fourth kernel of thanksgiving is the kernel of love and compassion. 4A crowns you with love and compassion. The word crown is a word picture which means to surround completely. God surrounds us completely with his steadfast love and compassion. The fact that we've been forgiven, redeemed, and healed should lead to a life filled with love for God and love for others. As implied in the, stu stu uh, implied in the story of the woman who washed Jesus' feet in Luke chapter 7, the demonstration of her love towards Jesus was evidence of her having been forgiven. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins had been forgiven, as her great love is shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. This love, coupled with compassion, as, as God has, has compassion for us to redeem our lives from the brokenness of sin, so we too should have mercy and compassion on others, especially whose lives have been broken by sin and its consequences. Does this mean we condone sin? No, it simply means that we're modeling ourselves after the Lord who saved us. From Philippians, let your gentleness be evident, the Lord is near. Let's make sure that our lives are filled with the gentleness and thankfulness, so full that we can't hide it so that we'll be a blessing to others. So let us thank God for his love and mercy and be his hands and feet. Our fifth and last slide, fifth and last corn, is the kernel of satisfaction and renewal. From verse 5, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. Youth is, of course, a picture of stamina, and the eagle is a symbol of soaring strength. So as believers, we should be characterized by a youthful hope and an energy and vibrant spirit, regardless of the years on this earth. In a sense, David is saying that the one who worships God enjoys a continuous revival within and finds strength to rise and live no matter how difficult the circumstances, like the eagle soaring from one height to another. For he satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul he fills with good things. John Wesley was the founder of the Methodist religion. And at age 21, he was at Oxford University. He came from, of course, a good Christian home. He was a gifted with a keen mind um, and good looks. Yet in those days, he was a bit snobbish and sarcastic. One night, however, something happened to set in motion a change in his heart. While speaking to a porter, he discovered that the poor fellow had only one coat and lived in such poverty as he didn't even have a bed. Yet he was unusual, but the porter was an unusually happy person, filled with gratitude to God. Wesley, being immature, thoughtlessly joked about the man's misfortunes. He said, what, e what else do you, do you have to thank God for? He said with a touch of sarcasm. The porter smiled with a spirit of meekness and replied with joy, I thank him that he has given me my life, a heart to love him, and above all, a constant desire to serve. Deeply moved, Wesley recognized that this man knew the meaning of true thankfulness. Sometimes those who have the least see the best and praise the most. In Isaiah we read, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, and they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. This is a result of living a fulfilled, satisfied spiritual life. We're constantly being renewed, refreshed, and revived in our soul, and God is doing it all. 
Jesus told his disciples that he was the bread and water of life. If our lives draw from the great resources of our Lord, we will grow strong as the day and years go by. Paul may have said it best, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. Well, there's our five kernels of corn. When I studied Psalms 103, I wondered why David had not asked for or given thanks for his possessions, his kingdom, his palace, his family, and so forth. And the conclusion I came to is these five things that are detailed in Psalms 103 are things we can't lose. The world can't take away these things. I can lose my loved ones. I can lose my home, my church, my ability to sing, my ability to preach, but I cannot lose the things that David wrote about in Psalms 103. So our five kernels are the kernel of forgiveness, redemption, healing, love and compassion, and satisfaction and renewal. Five reasons to be thankful for this season. As we sit down to dinner today and every day, separate just five kernels from the mountains of bounty before you and take time to thank God. Before we share in the offertory, I just want to remind you once again that the choir will sing our sending out hymn and you can remain seated. 
Would the ushers please come forward? Lord, I give you my feet to walk where your spirit will lead. Take who I am and help me be present where there is need. Lord, I give you my hands to serve people hurting with pain. Take who I am and help me be servant in Jesus' name. Lord, I give you my heart to love those who hunger for care. Take who I am and let me be love that is freely shared. Lord, I give you my life to use. Let me follow your ways. Take who I am and help me be blessing through all my days.
Will you all stand, please? And join with me now in the responsive reading. Come, you that are blessed by your God, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Just as you did it to one of the least of these, you did it unto me. Amen. Would you bow with me as we ask a blessing on the food? Our Father who art in heaven, we give thanks for our many blessings of life. We thank you for our individual wealth and the opportunity we have to share in the wealth of this land. And we would ask you to bless this food and nourish our bodies and our, we may use this strength to the furtherance of thy kingdom. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, thank you for bearing, thank you for bearing with me, how about that?